All right, good morning. Let's get started. <coughs> so are there any questions about um, the topics we covered in the last lectures, especially the, the project, the fuse, uh, fuse stuff, right? I suggest you, you look at the, the examples you know, as soon as possible. It's quite powerful. You can do a whole bunch of stuff. Um, what you're going to do for the homework is it's basically build a file system, right? And like I said, the, the mechanics you need to worry about is make sure that you send the right error messages. If you don't, then your program may give you some errors. So if you're trying to open a file and um, you didn't implement the right function, you may get errors or, or what have you, right? Um, for the most part, it shouldn't be too tricky to actually write the code, but it's a real system, right? So things may go wrong, so don't wait till the last moment. Um, because last year when they tried to wait till the last moment, if you're trying to start it on the night before the project, it's not the one you want to start, right? Unless you, you kind of know what you're talking about, right? Make sense? If you have any questions, let me know. And what, you know, something that will be covered here will be helpful in, in getting you to um, actually write the code. Um, and for the, for the most part, keep it simple. You know, don't try to do more complicated directory structures. Don't try B trees and all those things. Um, you can do that for the extra credit, but not for the base case. Make sense? Are there any any questions? If not, we can continue with the with the next chapter, which is on file system implementation. So the the way this this particular module is set up, you kind of start at the high level. You kind of look at the the, in the last lectures, we looked at the file system, uh, the how you access the file system and what's the system calls and stuff. And we're kind of working our way down towards the the hard disk and how this set up and stuff. So we're kind of moving from the upper application level all the way down to how the real hardware is set up and all those things, right? And that kind of leads to the the one thing we'll, we'll sort of look at today is a layered architecture. File systems are typically built as a layered architecture where you have the hard, the hard disk at one level and then sort of mimics what operating systems are built. You, know, you have the, the lower level stuff, then you have the device drivers, then you have certain abstractions all the way up to the application. And we, we never did that for the, for the memory stuff because memory is, is almost exclusively managed by the operating system. Right? You as a programmer, you as an application never get to choose different ways of memory managing memory. Whereas we'll see in file systems, there are many different file systems, they all have to kind of coexist. So you need this kind of a layering so that you can provide some common services and then you kind of modify, right? So for example, if you use Windows, you can use either NTFS or FAT and variants of FAT, or in Unix, you'll use Unix file system and so on and so forth. So you want all of these different file systems kind of build off of the same foundation, and that's what the layering will bring in. We'll see what, what that is. Um, and then we look at how you would implement the file system. You again have a notion of file control block, which is similar to a process control block. Keeps track of everything about a file, another data structure maintained by the operating system. <coughs> then we talk about how directories are implemented. We start, kind of mentioned it in the last class. It could be linear, simple, or, or more complicated depending on how many files you expect, depending on how you expect this to be accessed, right? To give you a sense of where these things come into picture, suppose you're building a database server, right? A database server operates on file systems in a different way. It may have one large file, it may open the file, manipulate it throughout your database, right? Whereas if you're, if you're serving file, uh, a web server, web server basically, when you, when you run a web server, every time you request a page, the web server has to open a file, read something, and then uh, close the file, right? So that may do a different way of accessing stuff. So if you have lots of files in a web server, you may be accessing the, the, the directory a lot. So you may have to optimize the directory such that your web server can be faster. So you don't think about it from the file perspective. It, it all depends on what you do with the operating system, right? <clears throat> so depending on that, you may have complicated data structures or simple data structures. And we look at how to allocate the, the storage, which is similar to what you did for memory module. The only difference here is you have to make sure that everything is written back to the, to the hard disk, right? Um, the, the key here is if the operating system forgets something about a page, if it forgot whether it allocated a page or not because of some bug, right? 
it's okay because you'll begin to lose pages from the from your operating system. It's called a memory leak, and it's it can be fixed by rebooting the system, right? Whereas in the file system case, if somebody forgets about a block, then it'll remain kind of hanging uh, hanging out there because the file system is expected to live forever, practically. So you want the everything to be written back to the disk, and if you don't, if something mess, get, becomes messed up on this disk, then that will remain there forever, right? And you would have seen aspects of this. How many of you remember uh, when Windows 95 and all, they used to run thing called scan disk, right? When you boot the system and you pull the plug halfway through, it'll go through a process called scan disk. It'll, it'll stay there forever and ever. Essentially, it's trying to re recreate what was messed up, and it's a painful process to run, and it's not quite, and, and I'll show you what exactly ScanDisk can um, give you. Many of the times, whatever it gives you is no use to you. I mean, it gives you some, some files and says, here's a file which I don't know where who, who it belongs to. Deal with it, right? So if you run ScanDisk, so remember, if you run ScanDisk, it'll create this file, I think, called ScanDisk 00 dot something, right? And you're supposed to go in and figure out what to do with that. Most of the time, you have no idea what those are, and, and we'll see why it happens. And you don't want to, you want to avoid that, right? Files, you tend to, to, to depend on that, right? How many of you, when you write to a file, expect the file to stay there without being modified? I'm guessing everybody, right? How many of you would be surprised to know that it's not always the case that it will stay, right? How many of you have been burnt by when you write something and things then stay? because your system crashed or something. And for the people who it happened, right? I'm, I'm sure it was not a pleasant experience, right? And you want to avoid that. And, and, and there's a lot more possibility of that happening here because in the memory case, if things happened, you just reboot the system, right? If your system crashes, it's, it's painful, you reboot the system, everything usually comes back to a good state with the files that doesn't happen, right? And we'll see how to manage free, uh, free blocks and stuff. Again, it's no different from the memory management stuff. You still have the logical notion of something on storage, and you want to write something, and uh, you want to manage what is free. But the, the, the catch here is you want everything to be returned onto the disk and, and taken back. Right? And one of the things that we'll do here is similar to what we, did, what we thought about in the memory section, which is the notion of should we allocate stuff to you in variable size chunks or in fixed size chunks? Right? In memory case, we kind of resolve that to say pages is what we're going to go with. Pages are con you know, it's a constant size uh, data, um, where you allocate data. We have a notion of a segment, which may be made of multiple pages, but from a system perspective, we deal with them as a, a, a constant, size, constant size allocation. Right? We, do the, we run into the same problem here, should we allocate whatever you want or should you allocate in blocks, right? So if you ask for, if you create a file with, say, uh, four characters, should I give you a file space with four characters or should I give you a, uh, a fixed size? You have the same issue of external fragmentation versus internal fragmentation. But for the most part, it's resolved. We go with the block size. We go with the constant size, sort of like a page. So throughout this lecture, we're not going to talk about it again. The same issues we had before happens here, we kind of resolved it the same way we did for memory, and we allocated in fixed size chunks, and we call them blocks, right? So we call them blocks in, in the memory site, we call them pages in logical space, and frames in the physical space. These are terms which tell me exactly what you're talking about, but they are the same concept. We allocate in fixed size units, right? And that, that kind of went with We'll go with how the hard disks are arranged, and we'll see that how, how they do that in, the, in, the, in a little bit. But, but the arguments we had before still hold, right? <clears throat> That's the nice thing about this, these two models, because they're sort of related. They, they're dealing with the same kind of concepts, yet they're slightly different because of the way things have to be remembered forever, right? And, and, and also the, in the notion of performance. Uh, the storage things tend to be much slower. Your hard disk is way slower than your main memory. So you want to be careful about that too, right? <clears throat> so, um, so, when, so, you know, so, we, so in the last chapter, we looked at the notion of a file system. So the file system consists of a bunch of directories and files which are associated with that. And you put them into a notion of a file system, right? And there are other issues that we don't quite 
talk about it yet. We'll look at that in a, in a, in a little bit more sense at the, when we talk about hard disk and stuff, which is the notion of how do we, we have to mention, we have to you know, give all this information to our operating system, right? So you take a large disk or large something, you create them into multiple partitions, right? So you have to have a way of kind of bootstrapping the system, right? You have to kind of be able to read this big stuff and figure out that there are multiple partitions and what those partitions are and stuff like that, right? So the way we do that is to pre-allocate certain chunks to the, to the system. So for example, this one happens. <coughs> I'm going to describe a hard disk as like this, you know, like a, a like a matrix kind of stuff. And we'll see hard disks are not like a matrix, They're, they have like sectors and stuff like that. But essentially, you have this big storage, right? And you make, create this notion called partitions, where you have, let's say, notion of a directory and all the files which go with it, right? Even though I call like directory is like somewhere up there, it doesn't have to be. Somewhere there's a directory, somewhere there's a notion of files and everything, right? And as we will see, you can have different ways of organizing this stuff. You can have different file systems, right? So for example, this can be NTFS and this can be FAT. These are two file systems that Microsoft did over the years. So you sort of have this notion of a large, some raw stuff and then you make them into these, these different stuff, right? So you will have to somehow give this to a running operating system, right? So to an operating system, you, operating system has got to be able to figure out that there are two partitions, right? Which means that this has to be on the hard disk so it can read it, otherwise it has to know somehow. So what you might end up doing is you may kind of allocate something before this. All it says is, that there is two partitions here, right? And so which, which means that every disk, every storage thing that you get, you first have to prepare it for use by operating system, where you say every storage, I'm going to say, let's say from zero to 1,000, will have some sort of a table which tells you everything about, these, about, the, about the, this particular storage unit. It's going to say there are multiple partitions. It's going to say where this, these partitions are starting. It's going to say what those partitions are, NTFS or FAT or, or what have you, right? And you leave it at, at that, right? And going back to the notion of a booting a file system, you may also say the, if you want to boot this particular file system, the OS is right here, and this is the boot sector, right? So you may say if you connect this, this particular storage to the system, read this particular table, and from that you can figure out where the operating system is, and that's called the boot partition. Essentially all this says is you have this table which tells you everything about the disk. The operating system or the lower level thing has to know how to read this stuff, right? So every, the lower level stuff has to know how to read this, it need not know how to understand what a file system is, right? What should we call this table? I'm sorry? Many of you may have seen this, right? Partition table, right? So this this tells is a table which tells you about the partitions. So you create this this stuff and you put them in a partition table, and the partition table, depending on the particular operating system, this may be variable size or fixed size, right? And this has to be understood by the lower level components of the system. So for example, if you think of uh, Windows based systems, right? This partition table has to be read by your bootloader, right? So which what happens is when you boot the system. At some point, it asks the, the BIOS, what are the different boot partitions, right? And it'll tell you that there are two, two hard disks in the system, right? This particular hard disk 
has an entry called boot partition, go read that to figure out how to boot the operating system, right? But, but also sometimes it lets you choose this stuff. So if you, many of you have booted into a Linux partition, at, at the beginning it asks you, I see a Windows here, I see a Linux here, I see a Mac OS or something. You get to choose, right? How many of you have seen that screen when you boot the system, right? So essentially what happens is, it whatever is asking you that, that boot program knows how to read this table and it tells you that I see three different file systems and you can choose to run one of those, right? So at the lower level, you need to know, understand how to do this stuff. Even though if you run, like for example, it's possible that this is a Linux file system. Let's say ext2, right? You may have something like this. The operating system which is running in NTFS may not know how to deal with this file system. But you have to know that there are two different partitions, right? So that's the notion of what you have to organize this thing. You have to take a storage. You have to kind of create something so that you can read what it what is in there, right? So, what happens if this gets um, trashed? Yeah, you yeah you you lose the stuff, right? So if 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 when the NTFS boots up, if it kind of goes and clears out the stuff about Linux you won't be able to boot into Linux anymore because you don't know where the partition is. So unless the partition table is correct, you have no idea what to look for, right? Because partition table is sort of the most important stuff. This is another case of how if I just go and change the this partition table, then this particular partition will vanish because it's no longer seen by you, right? So that, so that is the notion of a partition table and you set these thing, things up. And the, the process in which you create this stuff, these, these tables, is called formatting, right? It's called formatting a disk, or formatting a storage, right? So if you, if you get a new thumb drive or a disk or what have you, when you put it in the system, it'll first ask you, say, it'll say, this, I don't know what to do with it, I need to partition, I need to format this stuff, right? So formatting essentially means that it has to create enough information so it can be used. And that information may be something of this nature. It may have to change these tables, create these partition tables. It may not create any of this stuff, but it needs to create this table so it can go with that, right? And this need not be true for all the machines. So be the same for all machines. So for example, your Windows machines may do a certain kind of partition table. Your Mac may do a certain kind of partition table. So if you take a Mac file system, a hard disk, put it into Windows, it may say, I need to reformat it because you need to make sure you can understand this stuff, right? So you, you, you've probably seen this stuff without actually realizing what exactly was happening, but essentially that's what you're doing. So when you create a new storage, you format it to make sure that it can be read, right? And unless you, you create this data, so whatever data section you need to create, you can have to create at that time, right? You will have to do this for your homework project too. So in your homework project, you're going to treat you're going to treat, uh, I think I said 512 megabyte of something, right? I think I specified 512 bytes as the block size, and you're only allowed to read and write in that block size, right? So it's given to you that there are 512 byte blocks, right? So you have to first do a, do a sort of a formatting process where you write all the stuff that you need for your program to work, right? If you don't do that, all you have is, is this whole set of stuff, and you have to know how to read, you have to know where to start, you have to know how to do the stuff, and that information has to be somewhere, and in the case of a file systems, they have to be written onto the disk, because your program can, if you kill the program, start again, it has to be able to start, start back from where it, where, it, where it starts up, right? So it may have to create some directory structure, you may have to say, these blocks are directories, and, and what have you. So you, are, you have to do that uh, initialization process. Make sense? <coughs> so that, that's the, 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 the notion of a boot control block which tells, tells the system where you want to find the, the boot information to start the operating system and stuff. It's not exactly part of the file system, but it's essentially you need that to, to start your operating system. So it's part of the, you know, so you have to tell the file system where exactly things are so you can start the operating system, right? And you typically 
wall partitions are also called volumes. Volumes are a little bit more higher level because they can collect a bunch of partitions into volume. For now, we can associate they're the same, right? So partition table may have information about the block size that you're going to use for the file system, the, the file system you use, and, and so on and so forth, right? So when you boot up a system, I need to know that there are multiple partitions. I don't, I as operating system don't need to know how to read all the partitions, but if I have to use a partition, I need to read this partition table within the file system, which tells me stuff about the partition. You know, it's NTFS file system, this is a block size, and a whole bunch of issues. So when I start up the system, I read the main partition table, I read the partition, the control block within each file system. So that way I know what those are, then it becomes part of what I can present to you, right? So once I do that, I should be able to look at directories and, and, and other information which are part of the file system, which are specific to a particular file system. NTFS may treat things differently from uh, what Linux would do, but those are all part of how you deal with a particular file system, right? So you have all these things stored in, in this disk, you need to be able to read all those. And typically, the file systems are organized into layers, right? So this is sort of, if you think of the layers, this is sort of how you would organize. At the lowest level, you have the devices, right? So it could be a hard disk or a USB key or, or what have you. And then you have the, the ways to control this hard, the, the, the hardware. This is typically the device driver, right? The device driver knows that this is a hard disk or if it's CD or, or what have you. So it knows how to deal with this stuff. And at the upper, at the higher level is your application, right? This is how you access the, the file system. You have a certain set of layers here. The reason being, this layer may provide the most basic notions of what you have to do, right? And then you sort of build more complicated stuff, right? So the idea here is you may want to run different file systems. So I want to create the most basic stuff that every file system would want at, say, this layer, right? So what is the most basic stuff that you would want, you would require to build a file system? What operation can you think of is the fundamentally most important thing that you would need to, to operate on a file system, operating on a disk or files or what have you? I did specify two of those for your project, right? How many of you looked at the project so far? It's, the, I think, the step two of that stuff, right? The most basic stuff is read and write, right? You have to be able to read something, you have to be able to write something, right? So this is basically read and write, and since we are dealing only with blocks, this will only do read block and write block. So at the most basic level, you implement a function called read block and write block, which will read one whole block and it will write one whole block and nothing more, right? And, and then you build, you, you add different modules. And at the logical file system level, you want to create the different uh, file system that you want to build on. So one of the, one of the things that these, these levels will do is, turns out that different, so if you want to have multiple file systems on the same particular machine, there are two ways of organizing this stuff, right? Let me illustrate it. So let's assume that you have two file systems called NTFS and FAT. Let's not worry about how they are organized, right? I mean, they, they do stuff differently. So what happens is when you as a programmer write something, you never write specifically for NTFS or VFAT, right? You write using open, write, all the POSIX system calls, right? POSIX or Java or whatever you use to write the system calls, right? You never realize that they're using what kind of file system underneath, under, except under special circumstances. At the lowest level, let's say you're using hard disk here, right? So this and this, they have the same hard disk, right? So you, what you can do is you can build a device driver here. You can build a device driver here. You can build the read block, and you can build the 
right block. And then you can build the NTFS and you can build the fat here, right? So this is ways to implement different file system and operating system, right? So if you want to build another file system, you can draw, repeat this stuff over and over again, right? Over the years, people have gotten used to lots of file systems, right? If you, use, if you look at Unix, they, they have like about like 15 or so file systems which are part of the, the base, right? And there are more file systems which come out all the time. So if you keep doing this, your operating system will have to have all these different layers at infinitum, which means that for you to develop a new file system, you have to do all this stuff over and over again, right? So what they did was, they got rid of all this stuff, they have one device control, one basic block, the basic file system, and then they built a virtual file system called VFS, right? And you build your file system on top of it. So if you say NTFS or FAT or um, whatever operating file system you think of, you build it on top of this VFS. So VFS is powerful enough that it, it's more powerful than what you see here, right? It implements many of this functionality that you all the file systems typically want because all file systems typically have notions of directories and files and stuff like that. It gives those operations and you are free to implement each of those functions the way you want it, right? You're free to organize how the directories are set up, but the operations that you're going to operate on is all made to VFS. So when you write a new file system, you don't write for the hard disk, you write for the VFS, right? If you want to write a new file system, you basically write a file system which goes all the way to this notion of a VFS, and from then on, it's the, it's the same thing, right? And this is exactly what you're doing for your homework project. You're not actually writing to the hard disk. You are, if you, if you read the, uh, the project, you implement a function called read dir for your, for your program, and that's it, right? You implement how read dir does, but essentially, the notion that you have to implement read dir is comes to you because you're using a virtual file system, right? You have this notion of, so it tells you that these are operations that all file systems have to support. Your program will implement those functions, but you cannot implement something different, right? So if you want to implement a file system which is completely different than everything else that people have done, this is not the way to go. But if you want to implement a file system which is similar to what people have done, but a little different, then this is a good way. We give you all the methods, you implement these methods, everything else is common to the whole system, so you can go, go away and write a new file system, and essentially that happens, right? And what Fuse does is, it gives you interface to VFS, so whatever you write in your program connects to the, to the VFS layer, right? VFS is part of the, the operating system kernel, Fuse lets you talk to the stuff, but because of this abstraction, you are able to write a file system in, the, in this class project within a week or so. If you didn't have this, you'll have to spend months and years to write the whole thing because you need to worry about all the lower level details. Now everything is taken care, you have this one common thing, right? And because of this notion of this layered stuff and because you have this one high level abstraction you write to, people can go off and write different file systems, which may or may not be a good thing depending on which perspective you come from, right? But it's there, right? That, that helps you write different file systems. Does that make sense? And so when you write this, when you write the Fuse, realize that what Fuse does is gives you interface to VFS, which VFS is still part of the kernel. VFS is still part of the core of the operating system. Manipulating VFS directly is not a trivial task. Manipulating through Fuse is practically trivial because all it does is it takes whatever you're doing from your program and calls the appropriate VFS functions and you're done. Because everything else below that is already part of the operating system. Right? And, and we'll see why, how these things are really useful in terms of building operating, uh, file systems and stuff, but for now, having this stuff gets rid of the, having these different layers makes life easier, right? What are the, so can you think of negatives of having these layers? You're going to see this throughout the operating system. We never actually quite discussed whether it's good to have layers or whether it's, it's good to directly write, write a file system from scratch just for your system, right? 
what is the good thing about having a layering system? I actually kind of mentioned it before, but why would you prefer something which is layered rather than just the user and the device? You write the whole, whole stuff. This is this is also what you see in software engineering and object-oriented stuff and everything, right? Sorry. Did you actually debug it? Yeah, so if you do it right, it's it, maintenance and debugging should be easier, right? If you do it right, you should be able to do one device control. One of these, the different layers can be debugged separately because you have a clear interface. You say, I'm going to do a VFS interface. I'm going to call the, the stuff underneath. I debug it once. I can make it run clear and everything, right? So it's easy to debug, easy to port, and all those things. What's the bad stuff with this? This or any any layering approach. Why would you not like layering approach? Yes. Um, it's because it's more generally, you might not be able to take advantage of certain like special features. Yeah. So one of the things is the more the layer, the more rigid the layers are. You can't just do whatever you want, right? So if you want to do something which is kind of funky, you're really happy about some funky way of like manipulating the disk and everything, you just can't do, right? The, the same thing which says you can reuse the same thing over and over again also says that unless it's something which is useful for everybody, you don't get access to those stuff, right? And you, um, you typically can't do stuff that you may want to do. And you typically may see lower performance because you can't do the stuff. If, you, if you're really smart and you want to change the file system to do exactly what you want, you can't really do those stuff. So the performance kind of suffers, right? And over the years, that concern kind of goes away because machines are faster, machines have more memory and stuff. So you know, at the end of the day, the development cost trumps your need for the last bit of performance, right? For the most part, not for all the cases, right? So can you think of a, a case where you don't want all this abstraction, you want to know exactly, you want to manipulate the disk as it is, you think you know exactly what you want to do and you want to operate on them. There is one class of applications which, are, which think like that, which want to do like that. These class of application is very popular, they are very expensive, companies spend lots and lots of money to get those kind of applications. You want to guess what that application is? I'm sorry? Databases. Databases are one class of applications which operate on data. The data is stored on hard disk. And you spend lots of money to get those databases. And database companies don't like all this stuff, right? So if you're a database company like, say, Oracle, right? And let's say that your customer is Notre Dame. Let's say you're selling a database which is worth $20 million, right? So I'm going to sell a database which will do something for Notre Dame. And this are expensive stuff. I mean, the databases I'm talking about is not the ones that you run on your laptops or so, but you're running for the whole uh, organization, right? So if I'm going to spend like $20 million to put my database, I expect Oracle to get the last bit of performance out of the darn thing, right? I expect Oracle to say, or Oracle expects to say, we know how to do this stuff better than these people can do with the file system and stuff. So essentially, Oracle would say, I don't want all this abstraction. Give me the raw hard disk. I'll manage all aspects of it, right? And most file systems would let you do that through a raw, raw file interface, right? They also give a way to deal with the raw file and deal with the, the whole thing. Uh, and because, because the databases say, we know how to deal with this thing, we, we're not a file system, we don't deal with the file, we, we don't want you to access it a file, we want you to access it as a database. And so they, so even though all this stuff is nice, usually the file systems get you, give you a way to operate on the, on the raw hard disk, right? And backups is another thing which operates on the raw hard disk because they want performance and stuff. But usually what happens is like company like Oracle will work with companies like Microsoft, and basically, you'll have a machine 
whose operating system is, is tuned for that particular purpose. You don't just get, uh, you don't go off and buy Windows 2003 server or something, install it and put Oracle on it. You kind of get the whole package from them. And that takes over the whole thing. It's an operating system. It knows how to deal with that uh, hard disk and stuff, right? So even though we kind of say it's a small percentage of the entire market which does this kind of stuff, those tend to also be the ones which are pretty important all those things, right? But, but for the most normal human beings, this is, this is a good way to go about this stuff, right? <clears throat> so if you, if you take a course in, our, in databases, that's one of the things that you, you, you worry about. You want to figure out how to play with it. How many of you taken a course in databases? So if few of you have taken a course in database, right? So if you take a course in database, they spend all their life trying to figure out how to avoid going to the disk. They spend all their time trying to make sure they write to the right disk, get the stuff on the, right, the correct disk. They care about the accuracy of stuff going into the disk and all those things. All the optimization we're going to talk about the file system, it just annoys, it gets in the way. Because they know precisely that this record has to be in the disk right now, right? They know that if you don't do that, properties like ACID will be violated. And file system will say, no, I can wait because I want performance. No, I don't want that, right? So that's, that's one of the things. So essentially, um, so when you, you know, go back to the file system notion, you have a notion of a file control block, which is essentially sort of like a process control block. For each file, you want to have this thing, which has information about the file, you know, the file size and who owns it and, and, and so on and so forth. And also thinks about where the different blocks for the whole file are. And you can use that to access the file. Right? And it, it serves the same purpose as what you do for a process control block, except these things will have to stay on the hard disk, which makes life a little bit trickier. Right? And you will see as you go through, through your homework project how it becomes tricky, because you need to start reading and writing from the disk all the time. You can't just keep it and manipulate it easily, because you need to go back and go to the disk all the time. And if you don't care about performance, life is OK. But if you care about performance, you don't want to go back to the disk all the time because the disk is extremely slow, right? But other than that, it's, it conceptually is the same as the process control block. It's just that it has to stay on forever. So essentially, what happens is when, from your user space, if you, let's say, call open file, right? Within a kernel, it has to maintain these data structures, for example, a directory data structure or what have you, which may be on the, on the actual hard disk. You'll have to bring the stuff back and forth. You'll go through the directory structure to figure out which file you're trying to open, whether it exists, it can be opened and stuff. If it is open, you'll go read the appropriate file control block and bring it into memory, right? So in the subsequent action, if you do a read, from on a per process basis, it has to figure out where you are in the read process. So when you say read next, it can give you what you want. It also has a global system level stuff. If there are two people opening the same file, then it maintains some information about where the blocks are. It maintains some information about where exactly you are reading, where exactly somebody else is reading on a per file basis. And everything goes back to the hard disk. So it has to keep moving stuff back and forth from the, from the storage. You get performance by doing stuff here, but everything has to be backed up onto the storage. right? And this is a sort of what you do. So you, you write programs here, and this stuff is part of the, the file system stuff you're going to learn, we, we are looking at, and everything is, gets backed up on the hard disk. And like, like I mentioned, you know, having this virtual file system allows you to write all the file system that you want by just, so it, 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 it's a virtual file system, it, it gives you certain system calls that you have to implement. But once you implement that, you can implement any file system onto this one, and then the underlying stuff you don't worry about, right? So this, this allows people to write all kind of file systems. So for example, on the Windows, you have NTFS, FAT, and VFAT. You're supposed to have WinFS, which is the next file system for Vista, got pushed back and stuff. But you have certain Windows file system. There's a whole bunch of file systems for Linux and, and, and um, Unixes including ext2, ext3, which was the native for Linux, Unix file system, uh, vfat, which is the virtual fat file system, which lets you operate on Windows files. Um, RAMFS, which we'll see, is, is actually a memory file system. It takes some of your memory, acts like a file system. And tempfs and ricefs and all those things, right? So you have one API, you implement those, and everything happens. And this is sort of what you're doing for your homework project, too. <coughs> 
And so virtually this is what happens. So you have the file system interface, you implement the DFS interface, and underlying, you know, it, it conceptually implements different file systems because you're implementing this one concept, right? <clears throat> So, so now, now we are going through the different aspects of the implementation. The first thing we look at is directory implementation, right? Direct implementation is it's almost trivial except for the performance part, right? Almost trivial because all they do is they keep it's a big table which keeps track of the file name and the attributes of the file, right? So when you want to open some file, you have to go to the directory and find out whether this file exists and if it exists, some information about the file, right? So it's, it's basically a, a big table. So you can implement this as a simple case of a linear list, a linear table, or what have you. Um, the, the, the challenge would come in when you want to find some file, right? So if you have a large directory, and if you want to find a file, if you have a linear list, then I have to search for it, right? So depending on how I organize the file, I would have to search for the stuff. And searching would mean that you may have to read a whole bunch of blocks. So this is what happens. Let's look up a directory like this, right? So let's say it's a file called A, B, Z, Q, R, S, and so on and so forth. These are simple files. And you have information about where these files are, right? This is all you care about in a directory. But I want to, so if you ask for a file called S, I want to be able to say, oh, yes, you're asking for S. Here's information about this file, right? You need to be able to find that. So this is what you're trying to implement, right? If you implement this as a, as a list like this, right? And remember, if everything goes through a block interface, this may mean that this goes into block one, block two, you know, one, two, three, and so, so, so forth, right? What this means is, if you have them as a linear list like this, you'll have to do a linear search to find out what you're looking for. So if, which means that you'll have to first read this block, look for a certain number of entries, read the next block, read the next block, next block, and next block, and next block, and so on, right? So if you took a class in algorithms, you'll notice that the average number of uh, distance you have to search to find something is half the stuff, right? You could be lucky and find it in the first block or the last block. So on average, you have to go through half the block for a particular directory. Makes sense, right? So if this entries tend to be 10, let's say 10 entries, 10 files in a particular directory, this is okay. You can probably be inside one block, you're kind of okay. If you have, let's say 10 million files, then directory lookup would mean that you have to linearly search through all the 10 million records. That tends to be very slow. So you don't want to implement it like this. You may implement it as a hash or some sort of a sorted list, right? So hashing is one form where you can keep track of all things which start with A, B, C, and so on and so forth, um, and have a hash bucket behind that. Or you can build a whole binary tree with, with this kind of a structure, right? Building a, hard, a large tree is also complicated because to create, to insert something into a tree, you may have to read a whole bunch of entries, right? So for example, if you want to insert something here, right? let's say you want to push everything down here, right? Which means that you need to read this block, keep all these entries, entry a new entry, and then you have to read every block from here, shift everything down, and then write it. Does that make sense? If you, if you want to insert some entry here, right, you'll have this, this block, you can leave it as it is. The next block, you read the whole block, the whole contents, insert your entry, which means that every subsequent block entries will be shifted. So you have to read every one of those, shift the entries, and write them back, right? So uh, insertion here would mean that you have to read the entire directory and move the stuff around. Does that make sense? Because you're not dealing with, right? This is what you had, right? You, let's say you have these three blocks, right? To insert something here, right, would mean that 
this to here is fine. Whatever used to be from here to, let's say, all this way here, would have to be shifted down, right? Which means that you may have to allocate a new block here, and you may have to read the contents from here to here, and write it here. Contents from here to this block to this block, write it into this block, this block to this block, write it into this block, and this contents move it here. Does that make sense? You have to do this for your homework project, so you have to understand how, how you do that, right? You can't insert something in because you have to push all the stuff, right? So this would mean that you'll have to read the previous block contents, insert what you want to do, and then write it back. You can't just insert something in, right? So this small insertion would cause you to, to read all these blocks and write all these blocks, right? So you don't want to do that. So even if you had like a directory structure, if you want to add a new entry, if you have to do this kind of stuff, then you you slow <laughs> things down a lot, right? So, so depending on how many insertions and deletions and stuff you see, you build the file system directory structures in, in, in different concepts. Right? From a data structure perspective, it's not that complicated. From a performance perspective, the more blocks you have to read and write, you, you slow things down. So if you expect lots of file creations and stuff, you want to make sure that you keep that low, right? <clears throat> so that's, you know, so you can have the linear table or the, or the hash base table, um, right? So those are different ways of creating uh, directory entries. And if you, if you are adventurous, you can create uh, trees and, and, and stuff, right? The other notion is how to allocate blocks to a different file, right? Um, and this is similar to what we what we looked at for the for the uh, memory based system, right? I can do contiguous allocation, or I can do non contiguous allocation. In in this sense, there's uh, different things like linked and um, index allocation and stuff. The reason why you care about this is again performance, right? And I'm going to continue with this on the next lecture, but I want to finish with, with one, one, of the, one of the ideas. The notion here is, if you access a file, right? if I believe that you're going to read the file entirely from beginning to end, sort of what you do, like say, if you're doing a web server, you want to read the whole file. right? And depending on the hardware things, which we'll see later on, you may like contiguous allocation, because that may mean that you, you can get stuff faster. right? How does sim work similar to uh, your CD or something, right? CD player or something that's a little spinning stuff. So it's a lot easier to continue to read where it's reading rather than reading from different areas, right? If you don't believe that, if you take your CD player and randomly keeps changing the track, right? It takes a while to go back from back and forth. CDs are much better if, it, if they start playing from beginning to end, right? So if you are assuming that you're going to read the file from, from beginning to end, it makes sense for me to allocate those blocks in a certain fashion, such that they're all contiguous, right? So I, I may want to give you a contiguous allocation, but the problem with contiguous allocation is you can't grow, right? So if I gave you, like say, five blocks size, and if you want to grow, then I have to make sure that I can uh, 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 add you in somewhere, which means that you may end up saying, from some of your blocks are here, some of them are here, some of them are here, some of them are here, kind of stuff. And you may want to go through and kind of put them into one kind of stuff, right? Have you seen a tool which supposedly does this, which kind of you know shows like a big array of like some squares with different colors and says it'll go through a process and moves these things and keeps them all in some nice fashion, right? Some of you may have seen such a tool on Windows, right? You know what that is, what the tool is? Yeah, they have a, they they call this a fragmenter, right? Yeah, so the idea here is, if I can do this well before I have to run this stuff, if I do the allocation properly, I won't have to do this fragmentation stuff. But these tools actually go behind your thing and say, okay, I'm going to clean the disk, I'm going to move all the stuff, and then I'm going to make this stuff faster, right? So what we're trying to do here is avoid the notion of a fragmenter, because for people who use fragmenting tools, they're awfully slow, right? Right? And you, you, you can kind of guess why they would be slow, right? Because suppose it happens that 
I allocated for one process something here and something there, right? And I want to keep them all straight, which means that I may have to decide that I want to put something here, which means that whatever was here, I have to figure out some place to move this off. So I have to read all these blocks and keep it somewhere, and read that one and write it here. So essentially you're writing the whole disk, reading the whole disk and writing the whole disk once. You're kind of moving everything back and forth. And if you've done this, the, the larger the disk gets, it takes hours and hours and hours, right? And what we're trying to do is avoid all the stuff, do the allocations such that you can get good performance. And we'll continue with that on the next lecture, right?